Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good morning, uh, dear students, and also uh, respected adjunct professor that we have this morning with us, Professor Andrew Charlson from uh, New Zealand. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the second session of uh, your guest lecture. And today uh, we will discuss about uh, using RESIST as a tool to help us uh, develop our design. It can be in our studio or uh, a simple case, just like that we will have in our class uh, next week. So uh, as usual, uh, Prof. Andrew will deliver uh, his uh, lecture. Maybe uh, in the middle of his lecture, we will have a short uh, Q&A session. So you can uh, prepare your questions uh, as usual. And then uh, we can, uh, you, you can also share your uh, project or if you have any design that you need to discuss. And uh, also in the end of our session, you will have another Q&A. And if you are lucky, you may get some uh, souvenirs for the best uh, questions. So uh, please prepare your questions and uh, please install, uh, sorry, download the resist software. I already shared the link with you and then uh, do, uh, install that uh, to your computer and uh, you can use it uh, today, start today, and also especially next week, since we will have exercise next week uh, in this course uh, using RACIS software. I hope it will uh, help you develop your design and uh, help your understanding in structure and how to deal with earthquake. Uh, it's our everyday problem. So uh, once again, thank you, uh, Prof. Andrew, for joining us. And uh, without further ado, I will invite you to share your lecture. And uh, time and screen is yours, Prof. Andrew. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Johanita. Uh, hello, students. Welcome uh, to this my second um, lecture in this course. Today, as it's been explained, I'm going to be introducing you to the software called Resist. And so I'll begin by just sharing my screen with you. Here we are. So um, this is the the first screen on resist. But before I go into the detail, I just want to mention a couple of points to you. First of all, um, for any architect, the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges is to make sure that their building is strong enough for earthquake, uh, particularly in countries like Indonesia and New Zealand. And it's very hard to know when you are beginning a design how much structure you need and how large are the cross-section dimensions of your members. And so this software is designed for preliminary design. It's just designed, it's just to be used at the conceptual stage of a design to enable you to approximately work out how much structure you need and where it might go in your building plan. So resist is like a rule of thumb software. The results of resist could be given to a civil engineer who would then do very sophisticated and refined calculations to confirm the dimensions from resist. But before you need to consult a civil engineer, you are able to do your own earthquake design using resist. And I think one of the important points is that you do your design using resist so that you, the architect, have control over the structure of your design project. This means that you can refine your structure so that it best 
enhances your design concept and your program. Because if you leave that to the engineer, um, he or she might suggest structure that just isn't suited to your program or concept. So it's really best if you as the designer can do a preliminary design yourself. So resist is a rule of thumb software. And this means that there's no point in being overly accurate. It's probably only necessary to work to the nearest meter in dimension. You know, it's no, there's no need to work to the nearest centimeter. This is rule of thumb software, okay? And so don't, don't model your building exactly. It's not worth it. It's not necessary. But just do it approximately, and that will be close enough. You will have accurate um, dimensions for you to work with in your design. So before I start looking, I just want to go to the, um, the help section. And um, in the help section, there are several documents, including a step-by-step -step, um, guide to using Resist. And also there is information, that's the tutorial, and also there is information um, about the assumptions that are made in Resist. To keep Resist very simple for you, we've had to make quite a few assumptions that engineers usually make. But you don't really need to know these assumptions, except that they are there written for you if you want to know more about the software and its limitations and its, um, its advantages, I suppose. So there's some background um, documentation for you uh, if you want to ask questions you know, of the software. There's a lot of information there. So we are going to begin uh, a simple design of a building. And so I'm just going to demonstrate how we go about it. Basically, uh, what we do is we work along these tabs at the bottom of the screen. And so we start with building and we move right along. Um, as architects, we don't use this advanced tab. It's not necessary. So please don't use that. And then uh, at the same time, we use results, reports, the 3D model. And as architects, we never worry about displacements. That's not necessary. That's just for the civil engineers. So if we're designing a building, uh, we start off by choosing the importance of the building. And so if we're designing a normal building, say uh, an office building or a recreation center or something like that, it would be a normal structure. If it contains crowds or high value contents, like a museum, we would choose that. If we're designing a hospital or a police station or a fire station, then we would have to choose post-disaster functions. Because those buildings, like hospitals, typically they are designed to be up to 80% stronger than a normal building, you know, for obvious reasons. So let's design a normal structure. How many stories? Well, um, let's say it's going to be a four-story building, just a, a low to medium rise. We can go up to eight stories if we want to, but we'll just have a four-story building. Uh, the story height. So resist assumes that every story height is the same. Um, and so we'll keep it at 3.5 meters. Uh, the roof height. 
let's say we've just got a, a concrete roof uh, and it's therefore the height of the roof will be quite low, say half a metre, a half a metre parapet, say. Then we um, to resist the material of construction. So what are the weights of our floors? And, and down here, we've got some photographs, like that's a light floor timber which would be rare in Indonesia. Uh, then we've got um, tray deck flooring with concrete on top, which would be, which we'd use if we were designing a steel building. Then we've got um, heavy precast concrete or concrete flooring, which is what you would normally use in Indonesia. And so we will use heavy. Uh, for our flooring. Uh, then for the live load, um, we either choose domestic, office, or, a store, or storage. So let's say we're designing an office building. Uh, maybe it could be a health center or something like that. Then we'd have office as the, the live load. Then we've got interior walls. Uh, if all your interior walls were from um, brick, then we would have medium. If your interior walls were lightweight steel and dry framing, like plasterboard, then that would be light. So let's choose light. And we're going to have a heavy roof because we're going to have a concrete roof. So now we've told resist all of our building weights, the weights of the materials. Now we go to the floor plan on our building. We click um, the floor plan tab. And the first thing is uh, we've got to set the dimensions of our building plan. So we normally we'd start set rectangular. And um, let's design a building that is roughly uh, 40 meters long. It's quite a large building by 20 meters wide. Uh, say, say, say 15 meters wide. And I just zoom to fit. And, um, and so we get this image of our building. And straight away, you can see that the initial structure is, I'm just going to put it on the perimeter. So just with a left click, you can drag your structure anywhere and plan. Like that. So now I've put all that structure on the outside. This is the default structure that we will now change. But I just want to explain to you that um, resist can do any polygon. And so if we put our cursor on the exterior wall and right click, we can add a point. Right click, add a point. Right click, add a point right click at a point. And, and now we can manipulate the building plan and create any, pretty much any polygon shape you want. So if we wanted to, if you had a circular building, you could um, make it into a polygon of, of roughly the same area, and that would be close enough. So we can we can create a building of any poly, polygon shape. So let's say we're happy with this this shape of building. This is the this is the, the shape that we want for our site and our program and our concept. 
Uh, and so we, fin we finalized the, 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 the dimensions and the shape of the building plan. And it's, it's four stories high. Uh, and the, uh, the average story height is 3.5 meters. Now we go to the earthquake tab. And we have to put in the hazard factor, which is a factor that represents the seismicity of your building site. And so for Jogjakarta, I, I think you'd, you'd choose something like about 0.3. That something like that would be about right for, for you in, in central Java on the, on the coast. Um, there's a map, but this map is just for New, New Zealand. So it's not relevant to you. Uh, but in my own city of Wellington, uh, the, the hazard factor for Wellington is 0 0.4. And then um, the second and final choice you've got to make is regarding the soil type. Because um, soft soil can amplify the earthquake shaking. And so we've, re we've got to identify sites with soft soil because um, our buildings actually have to be stronger if they're built on soft soil compared to building on sites under, uh, overlain or underlain by, by rock. So let's say uh, we're building on a soft soil. And there we've got those, we filled in that tab there. Then we go to wind. And um, wind isn't really an issue in Indonesia, unless you are building a, a timber building. And so you don't need to bother filling in this information. You can just leave it as it is actually, um, because wind will, nev will never be critical if you're designing a concrete, a concrete building. So now resist, um, it knows the materials that you are using for your design. Now resist knows your floor plan and how many stories. It knows the seismicity of your building because you've put in a hazard factor of about 0.3. And now you're ready to design your structure. So then we go to, we'll just see which direction is this, so X direction. So now we, we're going to design the lateral load resisting structure in the X direction. And as I explained in the last lecture, as architects and engineers, we have a choice of three structural systems to resist earthquake forces. We can use walls, we can use moment frames or braced frames. And in, in, and in one direction, we've got to choose one of these systems. So let's, let's choose uh, in the X direction, let's choose moment frames. And so we're going to choose moment frames. And look, here's what a moment frame looks like, um, columns and beams. And we can choose the material. Uh, we can choose reinforced concrete, structural steel, or timber. Now, it's, it's probable that in Indonesia, you would use reinforced concrete, but um, structural steel is, is becoming a bit more popular. But anyway, this is what a, a reinforced concrete moment frame looks like when the frames are put on the perimeter of this high-rise building. And here is what a steel moment frame looks like. You know, you can see the columns and the rigid connections between the beams and the columns. Every time these joints have to be rigid. 
And so this is a steel moment frame, and it's unlikely that you'll ever use it, but this is what a single story timber moment frame looks like. Once again, um, a rigid and very strong connection between the, the beams or rafters and the columns. So we're going to use reinforced concrete uh, for this building. And initially, I'm going to just use two lines of framing. Now, to do this, I've got to go, oh, well, no, I'll just say I'm using two lines of framing. And um, I'm going to use, say, at the moment, I've got two bays of these frames. I'm going to use, I'm going to use more bays because the more bays I use, uh, the smaller are the members. The smaller the beams, the smaller the columns. Uh, perhaps I'll just use four bays at the stage. And the bay length, I can choose the bay length. That's the dimension between the center line of the columns. Uh, it's six meters, which is a, a sensible bay length. Um, any length more than eight meters is not very sensible. And then um, I've got to choose the floor width supported by the beams. So if I Look here. Now this is 15 meters. So I would I'd probably have a central line of columns along here uh, with a beam on over the columns supporting the floor slabs. Uh, actually, I'd probably have two, two lines of columns, one line along here and one line along here. And that would mean the floor slabs would be spanning five meters. So if the floor slabs are spanning five meters, it means half of that length will be resisted by these beams of these moment frames. So half of five is 2.5. So the floor width supported by the beams of my frames is 2.5 meters. Here we are. And the final tab or field we've got to fill in is we've, we've got to guess the depth of the columns. That's the depth of the columns parallel to the beams. Now, if I look at this, structure I've designed, um, the columns look very, very weak to me. At the moment, they are 0.3 meters, 30 centimeters. Um, that just seems a bit too small for me. So I'm going to increase them to say about 0.6. And I'm going back to the floor plan and I'm going to integrate my frames a bit better with the geometry of the, of the building. So now my frames are there. And so um, in the X direction, all the earthquake loads are resisted by the, that frame in this frame, and the columns and beams that are used elsewhere to support the floor slabs, they just resi resi resist the gravity forces. They just take the weight of the floors and the live loads. And so they can be, those members can be quite shallow and slender. And so this design would be fantastic if you wanted maximum transparency in this area of your building. This would be a great design. Okay, now we move to the structure in the Y direction. 
the structure in this direction. And at the moment, the default structure is just two structural walls, one here and one there. And um, because I told you that maybe we, we, maybe we want maximum transparency at this end of the building, um, I'm still going to use structural walls, but I'm going to move this wall back into the plan of the building. So maybe, maybe, well, I don't know, maybe have it there. And then I've got another structural wall at the back of the building there. So I'm going to assume that the entire earthquake force on this building is resisted by two structural walls. So I go to structural Y, uh, use structural walls. Yep, that's correct. What material? Well, I can use reinforced concrete. I can use reinforced concrete masonry, or I can use plywood. Here's a concrete, reinforced concrete structural wall. Here's a reinforced concrete masonry where there is reinforcement vertically and horizontally in the concrete blocks that are grouted with cement and mortar. And here's a very simple plywood shear wall or structural wall, timber framing with plywood. Well, let's go for the best material of structural wall reinforced concrete. We've got two walls in plan, and the walls are four meters long. I think they might be a bit short, so I'm going to make them six meters long. And so that's them in plan, one, two. And the wall thickness, maybe the wall just needs to be 20 millimeters thick, 20 centimeters thick. Point two. So now I have done a design for this building for the earthquake loads. And so the next step is to go to the results. And they will tell me whether I have over-designed my structure or whether my structure is too little or too small. So first of all, we look at the results in the x direction. And you can see all, wherever you see red, um, that means fail. So my, my, my frames that I've designed, they are failing for the ultimate earthquake and also for small earthquakes. And they're failing because um, the moment that's it's the bending strength is insufficient. The bending forces on the frame are 121% of what the codes allow. So my frame members are too weak. My columns and beams are too weak. Not by much, just by 20%. Our drift is 148% of what the code allows. And the drift is the horizontal deflections during earthquake. So the frames I've designed are too flexible for earthquake. The building's going to shake too much and it's going to move too much and that's gonna cause additional damage. So I've got to go back to my design and make some changes. I've got two options. First, I can increase the size of my beams and columns. Or secondly, I can add more structure, like another row of frames. Let me increase the member sizes. So I go back to lateral structure X, and my columns were six, 60 centimeters. 
Now I'm going to increase the size of them. And there we are. If they're 70 centimeters, my design is perfect. All these values are quite close to 100%, which means that my design is economical. Like, for example, say I made the columns really deep, um, say a meter deep, then you can see that these values are well below 100%. And that means that my design, I've over designed. My building is stronger than necessary. Okay. And so our client will be paying more money for this unnecessary structure. So you always want to be, make an economical design. Don't waste money or materials. And like if our columns were one meter deep, uh, this is what our building, our frame would look like, you know, pretty, pretty heavy columns, because that dimension is one meter. And, and the beams are probably about the same depth. So anyway, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go back to the original design uh, where these columns were 0.7. It's a perfect design. And so this is what the model looks like. Uh, 70 centimeters long, the columns. And if we go to our results again and click on other results, it tells us that our column depth is 700 millimeters, which is what we designed. And its width is 420 millimeters. So it's a rectangular column because it's, it's just working in one direction, in the X direction. And the beams, uh, they are going to be uh, 700 millimeters deep. And their width is about 360 millimeters. So resist tells you what the dimensions are. And immediately you can just draw these onto your plans. This also tells you uh, what the foundations are. And in this case, um, you could, we could have a uh, we could have square pads, uh, three meters square by 0.6 meters deep. And we could also, we might need some tension piles, some 300 millimeter diameter piles uh, to stop the frame from overturning in an earthquake. So there we finished that um, design in the X direction. Now in the Y direction, we use two walls and you can see that my original guess was quite good. We've just got a slight fail. Once again, those walls are a bit too flexible. And so let me go back and just make those walls a little bit longer. Uh, and maybe make them six and a half meters long. And that fails. So I'm going to make them a little bit thicker. And there we are. Um, actually, if I just make them a bit thicker, that might be enough. It is. So if I make the wards a little bit thicker, now they um, are not failing anywhere. And so we've got a really good design. So click on the other results. Um, because the lateral structural separation in the Y direction is 70% of the building width, which is acceptable. So there's no problem with torsion. Um, as far as penetrations go, um, as the wall stress is high, we're only allowed very small penetrations for services, just, just that size. Um, but above 
say two stories, you're allowed to have larger penetrations for windows and maybe even doors. But at the bottom of the building, where the forces are the greatest, um, we're only allowed these small penetrations. And this gives you guidance about the foundations you need under these walls. And so with that, um, I can say this building is perfectly adequate uh, to resist earthquake forces from any direction. But just remember, you know, you will have columns um, dotted on your building plan. If I just draw, uh, here we are, draw. And so resist doesn't show you the little columns you need to resist your gravity loads. So, you know, you will definitely have columns in these places. And um, this is your, and so you, you might have, you might have a beam there and a beam there. And these would be your floor slabs spanning about five meters. And as I said, um, you'd also have columns running up the middle of your plan in here uh, with beams on top. Just dot the beam in. And maybe the beam would, would sit on top of the structural wall. It's okay. And then these would be your floor slabs spanning between your beams. So that is, um, that is one design we have done. Now, just before I finish, just one final thing is, um, I'll just switch off my, um, here we are. Um, the final thing to tell you is about reports. But before you print out your report, this is still drawing. Before we print out a report, please just orientate your, uh, your model so you can see all the structure quite clearly, say like that. Then you click on image and you just click on set image for report. Click. And this is the image that will be, pres uh, will be printed out automatically in your two page report. So you go to reports, uh, you always click on architectural because you guys aren't engineers. So just click on architectural, fill in the project and your name, and then Resist will print out a two page report for you, which just gives a summary of your input and your results. So uh, there we are. Um, so now I'm going to just stop for a time of Q&A. And um, it's an invitation for you to ask um, any questions about Resist that you would like. OK, uh, thank you, Prof. Andrew, for the first part of the lecture. I would like to invite the students or uh, tutor. We have also tutors and also lectures here with us. Uh, you can raise your hand or just activate your uh, microphone and discuss directly <clears throat> with uh, Prof. Andrew if you have any questions. Um, yeah, any questions from the students first? Okay. Uh, yeah, Omar, raise hand. Please, Omar, uh, activate your camera and you can discuss directly with Prof. Andrew. 
Yes, okay, Doctor. Yeah, actually, I have a question. Uh, it related to the phenomenon of uh, the earthquake. Okay. Like uh, right now, uh, we are living in Indonesia, and uh, I think this uh, area uh, prone to earthquakes. So, uh, can we use uh, a special material or methods for uh, construction that are uh, not affected uh, uh, by uh, dangerous uh, earthquakes? For example, like uh, focusing on building the uh, foundation of our building in a way that uh, can uh, withstand the earthquake or uh, focusing on uh, design our uh, column uh, is uh, using a material like uh, rubber, uh, like uh, not to affect it badly in our building, or uh, mm. right now uh, we can't. Well, I'm, up, I'm afraid you've cut out. But look, yeah. you're asking you're asking a really good question, um, and the the answer is that researchers around the world are working really hard at trying to find you know alternative systems, alternative materials. But the reality is, in in most countries, and and certainly including um, my own country and countries like the US and Japan. You know, most of our buildings use reinforced concrete or structural steel. But we do have engineering codes of practice that mean that we can design for earthquakes quite safely using these heavy materials. There are some new technologies, like, for example, seismic isolation that you could Google and find more about. But those technologies are really only used on very special buildings like hospitals. And so for most buildings, and like Indonesia, for most of your houses, you know, you, you need to usually use conventional materials, but using the principles that I've given you, um, these buildings can be safe in earthquakes. And so just keep on using the traditional materials and, and they will be safe. I mean, obviously timber buildings are by far the safest because they are relatively very light and um, not affected so much in earthquakes. And so timber is the best material, but let's be honest, that is not practical for most people in Indonesia. And so, Mostly your buildings will be of concrete and maybe using some masonry walls. Uh, but if they're designed properly using the principles you've heard and the software, then they'll be safe. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Omar, for the questions. Actually, Omar is not from Indonesia, Prof. Andrew, so maybe his local material is not similar with uh, the one in Jogja, <laughs> even though he is now okay. in Jogja. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I, uh, but I think that earthquake is not a big issue in your country, right, Omar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we it's don't not have a, here, yeah. yeah, it's not as uh, earthquake prone as Indonesia or New Zealand, I think. Okay, uh, okay. thank you, Omar. Uh, we have one uh, questions from uh, our professor Bu Sharifah, uh, but she is currently, uh, yeah, uh, she wrote her questions through our meeting chat. So I will uh, read for you, Prof. Andrew. Uh, dear Prof. Andrew, thank you very much for the insightful material. There is one thing I need to confirm. Can we take the output of resist as for the result of the analysis to other uh, CAD product, computer aided design product, or maybe BIM software? Or how is the interoperations among this software, among other software? Thank you in advance for your answer and discussions. Uh, so please, Prof. Andrew, maybe uh, you can answer who Sharifah. Yes, um, look, that's a really good question. Uh, the answer is there's, there's very limited um, 
sharing with other software. Uh, if we go to file, we can export. Uh, we, we can do a certain amount of exporting. Oh, let me just check on the 3D model too. Yeah, look, the best we can do actually is to save um, our 3D model as um, a PNG file. And then we could import that into some other software. But the, the software doesn't really fit in very well with other softwares like BIM. But the thing is, you know, your, your model is simple. To model your building, you simplify it. And so it's very quick to make a quick model in Resist. And then you could just take the dimensions of these columns and then um, you know, input them into your BIM um, software. So yes, there's, there's, not, there's not a high degree of um, capability of transferring this information across, I'm sorry. Um, but because your resist models are usually very simple, um, you can, it's quite easy to, to make a separate model and resist and, and get your results and then go back to your BIM software. So yeah, thank you, a really nice question. And I, I hope that is helpful. Okay, thank you, Prof. Andrew for answering uh, Julia's questions. So I think the, uh, we emphasize the use of phrases uh, actually to uh, make our work when we do some uh, initial modeling easier yeah. and also yeah, mm. to make uh, the process faster if we need to create several alternatives, I think. And also that's why we also use this one for our students in studio because uh, if uh, we have a long design process, uh, it will be better to use a practical one. So they can just move from one alternative. Uh, if that's not good enough, then change uh, quickly in just a couple minutes. I think uh, that's the uh, principle of using races. I hope it's correct, Prof. Andrew, uh, because that's what we usually do with uh, the students. Yeah, and absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's exactly the correct way, uh, Johanita. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, I have also uh, one more question, Prof. Andrew, actually, uh, because this is uh, usually uh, some students question this. Uh, when we model the, uh, let's say, lat lateral structure, uh, or uh, let's say we use a uh, concrete frame, uh, concrete moment frame, and we choose the depth of the uh, column as 70 centimeters. And then uh, when we check the result uh, in the green tab on top, uh, the program will give us suggestions. Your uh, column size will be uh, this much and this much. So uh, which one that we should follow? Uh, because some students assume that when we model lateral uh, structure as moment frame and the depth is 70, it means that the column size will be 70 centimeters by 70 centimeters. Or uh, should we follow the uh, green tab, the, re the result from the green tab? You should always follow the result from the green tab. Okay. Because that will give you an economical mm -hmm. okay. design. Because your frame is just strong in the X direction. And so the column has to be like deep in the X direction, but it doesn't need to be so deep in the Y direction. Okay. And so therefore um, your columns can be rectangular and that means it is very it is far more efficient than having square columns. However, if you had moment frames in the x direction 
and the y direction, then you may have square columns mm. because the, the columns have to be strong in both directions. Okay. So if we have a, a moment frame for x and y directions, uh, the size of the column in the end will be like following the biggest one from the two. It, yeah, that's right. That, that mm. might be a way to do it. Yes. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Because some students actually ask me about that. And also uh, the next question usually, uh, can we uh, modify the size of the column as long as uh, in the end the area is still similar? Maybe you can also answer that uh, questions later, Prof. Andrew. I will answer that now. Yes, look, you, okay. can, you can modify the shape of your columns. Like, as I said, resist is like a rule of thumb software. And it, it's giving you approximate dimensions. And it's also giving you rectangular dimensions. So if, for example, you might want your columns to be elliptical, and so make them elliptical, but make them with the same depth, you know, as a rectangular column, you know, and you'll be close enough. Mm -hmm. Or or if you've got a two-way frame, um, instead of having a square column, why not make them circular columns, you know, of about the same dimensions? And and that's fine because you know, the engineer maybe will have to put in a little bit more reinforcing steel, but, you know, that's fine, no problem. And so you could have these lovely circular columns instead of may, maybe more brutal square columns. It's up to you and your concept. Okay. But yes, I mean, resist gives you a simple answer and you can feel free to do some small changes to the to resist. Because if you make small changes to the dimensions or the shapes or the spacing, you know, it's not going to affect the results much at all. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Andrew. I will uh, pass the information to the students because they usually ask that all the time. Uh, and I think, yeah, it will be uh, fun for the students to modify uh, the column. So now uh, we usually use the biggest dimensions whenever we want to change the shape of the column into a uh, round or circular. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, is there still any more question from the floor, maybe from students or uh, tutor or uh, professors? Okay, I think we don't have, oh, Pikri raised hand. Okay, please Pikri. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry if the question is a bit unrelated to the subject, but are there any future plans to um, you know, make RISIS available for Mac or Apple users. Okay, thank you, Bikri. This is also always the always uh, <laughs> we have this question all the time for of Andrew. Uh, no, the answer is we're not planning on making it available to Mac because we know that you can change the configuration of your Mac to emulate a PC. So in theory, you are able to run DOS programs on your Mac. I think there are a couple of ways you can do it. Yeah, you now, definitely could, yeah. Yeah, and I, but I know it's awkward and it's annoying, um, but at the moment we haven't got any funding to to, to, to make it available on, a, on an Apple. So I'm sorry. I mean, why not? one suggestion I've got is you could always perhaps go to an internet cafe and just for a small fee, um, use the PCs there and, you know, do your design work using Resist just there, just for this, 
for a few, um, you know, a few dollars, as it were. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Okay. Thank you, Bikri. Or you can just come to our uh, computer yeah, yeah, laboratory. Yeah. It's open 24 hours, so uh, and, all, <laughs> and all the computers are Windows, so you can use it all the time. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Man. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's what our students in Wellington do if they've got apples. You know, they come and use the, com the computer labs uh, on campus. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think we can continue uh, to the second uh, session, second part of your lecture, Prof. Andrew, uh, before we uh, open another Q&A sessions. Okay, righto. Well, now I'm going to just show you how useful Resist is to explore different designs. And so let's, let's stick with this building here and let's say that we don't want these shear walls here. Let's say we want a strong sense of circulation along our building. And instead of these shear walls, we want to have moment frames that we can walk through. And the frames will like express the circulation. So what we do is we go back to the floor plan uh, and we first of all, we're going to put in a lot of frames running this way. And so I'm going to add an element in the Y direction. See, I'm adding all this additional structure in. And say I have the first frame here. Now, I, if I want to, I can just make these frames align perfectly, um, but I'm not going to bother. I mean, that's sort of close enough. And then I'm going to go to the lateral Y structure and make these frame, these walls into frames. And I'm going to make them just one bay. And see, see how we've got this potential circulation route through these frames. And so now our structure looks like that. Now these frames look a bit small to me, so I'm going to make them a bit bigger, say, say 600. And so now the earthquake forces on this building are resisted by um, eight frames. They're six, the bay length is six meters. Let's say we want the bay length to be four, uh, four meters. There. And so now all our earthquake forces are going to be resisted by these single bay frames that are strong in the Y direction. See, it's strong in the Y direction. Let's look at the results. Well, actually, these frames are. Uh, they're just, they're just failing, aren't they? So I just need, need to make them a wee bit larger. Oh, sorry, um, in the Y direction. Oh no, the frames are failing quite badly. So I've got to make them quite a lot deeper. There, that's close enough. So the frames are 95 centimeters deep. And so that is what the structure would look like. And so, you know, this structure could be a brilliant um, solution if your design concept was to have a very strong sense 
of internal circulation. Because you know you'd be you'd be walking through these quite large frames, and you'd have a very strong experience of of walking through them. So. So, say, so that's another option, you see. And now we've got our results. Um, we've hardly got any failure. Because I've added more structure into the building, I've got to make the X structure a wee bit stronger. And so I've got to go back and just make the columns and beams just a little bit larger because of all the additional concrete that we've used um, in this new design. And so, I mean, now I'm using a lot more concrete. This isn't a very efficient, des this, this design isn't particularly economical or sustainable because I'm using a lot more structure, but you can justify it on the grounds that you're designing this wonderful circulation route um, through your building. And I mean, if you wanted to, uh, you could really celebrate the circulation route, you know, by having, having your frames create like a curved circulation route. So imagine that. And so you could have a design concept you know, where you wanted to have this beautiful curved circulation route defined by these concrete frames. So, you know, this is, this is another option for you. But then you might say, oh no, I don't, you might say, oh, well, my, my um, design concept is just perhaps to have a, a couple of strong frames. And so, okay, we right click, we delete elements, delete that element. And so now we might have four frames. And what are the results? The results will be failure because we've got less structure. And so what I'm going to do is to make these frames two bays. And so now, now our frames like that, and then if I make them three bays, uh, make the bay length, uh, say five meters, then I can end up with potentially square columns where these columns will join up. And so let me see what the results are now. Uh, in the y direction, I'm just a fraction I'm failing by just 15% because my, my frames are too weak in shear. And so I have to make them just a wee bit, oh. If I make the columns a bit um, deeper. There, the columns have to be, they're quite be deep. They'd be as deep as that, 1.2 meters. And so here is another option. And so we would rationalize this option uh, by having having these columns integrated. So that would be like one square column there. Uh, this would be a square column, a square column there, and so on. And so we would make would make those two columns like this one column, most likely. Um, resist, unfortunately, 
can only have structure in the x and y direction. And so where we have a slight angle, then we just have to put the structure um, as close as possible to that angle. angle. So that's a limitation of the software. So just you know, bear that in mind. If we wanted to, we could bring one of these frames uh, to the front of the building. And this frame we could we could bring in there. And so we can adjust our structure, you know, to suit our planning uh, and and our design concept. And that's always what we try and do. Let's say that um, we want to have bracing, cross bracing on the in the in the x direction. And so if I go back to the x direction, I can choose bracing. And I can choose um, diagonal bracing of any any sort really. And even like in the Pompidou Center, tension only bracing. But say um, I have concentric bracing. Um, I can just use, say, two bays. Look at the results. Oh, my braces are failing. So I've got to make my braces a lot larger. And there we are. I've, I've done the design. So if we want a braced frame, um, in the y in the x direction, that's what we need. We need we could get away with just two bays with with diagonal bracing like that. Um, if we wanted to, we could change the uh, sorry, we want two bays. We could have the bracing like this, where we could have a brace bay, then no bracing, then more bracing. And so resist enables you to have you know, some flexibility in the way that you choose your bracing. But I know that in, um, in Indonesia, you know, mostly you'll be using reinforced concrete and you will be using, um, often you'll be using frames, but I would encourage you to use shear walls where you can because shear walls are more reliable and, and are safer than using frames. So those are the main uh, features uh, I'm showing you. And so I've shown you, just finally, let's see what shear walls we need in the X direction. So we go to the um, X direction, yes. We choose structural walls. Um, we're going to use reinforced concrete. We've got two walls. And, and my guess is that they'll have to be about six meters long and 20 centimeters thick. The results uh, here are our walls in the X direction. And look, they're all fine. Uh, it's quite an economical design because we're up to about. 80%. If I want to, I can make them a wee bit shorter. Yeah, I, we can make them five and a half meters uh, long, and they still comply with the code. So if I go back to my floor plan, if I want to, I can we can bring the walls into the plan. Like they might be part of a core. And uh, the results are the same, no problems. If the walls are too close together, see how we get this red flashing tab? That tells us that the separation distance, this distance here, is too small, and the walls are not able to withstand the torsion in the building, the twisting. 
And so if we get a red flashing light like that, uh, we have to, we're forced into making our walls further apart. And now it's, now it's not a problem. And so now in this building, uh, we've done the design. It's perfect. Actually, our, our um, frame is over-designed. So I'm going to reduce the size of the members of the frame. They, they're too big. So I'm reducing the size of my columns and beams. There we are. So now I've finished a frame, a frame building uh, in the Y direction, four strong moment frames. In the X direction, two 5.5 meter long, sorry, um, in the Y direction, sorry, in the X direction, two 5.5. But you know, if you want to, these, these wall, you could have one wall on the perimeter. Like this could be an area of services or toilets or bathrooms. You could have a wall there and you could have your other wall. Um, well, it could be near the center of the building. And so your building isn't as symmetrical and we might find our results are not quite as good, but they're still okay. So look, there's another design. And if you want to, this wall could be at the end of the building. And so, you know, you can, you can place your structure to suit your planning and your design concept. This wall could be on an angle there. So resist helps you understand not only how much structure you need, but where, you know, you can place it and plan. See, that's no good. You can't have the structure without separation. And so if I start to separate this, then it's okay. The torsion is not a problem. So resist gives you the opportunity to experiment. You know, very quickly, you can try out different structural systems um, in different plan areas and, and get a very accurate, approximate dimension of your structures. Well, look, I think I'll stop now. And shall we see if there's any more questions? Uh, questions or discussion. I'm sure students will have more questions for me. And so I look forward to that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Andrew, uh, for the second part of the lecture. I would like to invite students uh, or tutor or also lecturer to uh, raise hand or open mic and uh, discuss directly with Prof. Andrew. You can ask about uh, the uh, racist or if you uh, try your project with racist already, maybe you can um, discuss or even uh, show if you want to. But I think this is the first time for you since you are uh, only at the second year now, uh, but for the tutor, actually, uh, they are very familiar with this. Uh, they use this every year, and also um, they help the students use uh, races every year. So I think uh, for the tutor, they are already very familiar with this. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm still waiting for any students or tutor to raise hand and discuss. Okay, uh, or maybe uh, you can also share uh, if you want to ask, <clears throat> sorry, if you want to discuss your, uh, let's say, studio case and you want to try it with traces, since now you have, um, I think your case now, it's, it's possible to 
uh, do the simulations mm. for your case uh, with resist because now your design is two stories. I think it's a good start. I think it's a good way to start uh, simulating your design with resist. But uh, yeah, while we are waiting for the students, uh, I think I have a question for you, Prof. Andrew. Uh, the uh, questions usually, uh, actually this is also from students since we ask the students from seventh semester to use races, usually the design is a bit uh, complicated. Um, for example, when they design a plan, uh, usually it's not rectangular, but maybe uh, like, uh, yeah, non-regular, uh, maybe uh, it's oval or uh, circular. And then uh, sometimes they find difficulties to uh, model their main structure. Uh, is there any strategies how we can uh, model the non-regular uh, plan to uh, resist and then uh, another question usually if uh, they have triangular building because um, when they have triangular building they want to make a shear wall or a core actually consists of shear walls and the core usually also triangle uh, is it accurate enough if we uh, create let's say in resist that uh, our core is square but uh, actually in uh, real design, it's triangle. Meanwhile, for the floor plan itself, it's no problem because in resist we can just add the uh, green dot and then uh, modify the floor plan. But for the core itself, usually we end up uh, simulated as a uh, square, as a uh, non-triangle. Uh, maybe you have some suggestion for uh, that, Prof. Andrew? Yes, that, that's a really good question. Thank you. So. Let's um, let me um, modify uh, this structure. I'll just I'll just delete um, these frames. Um, right click and delete. Oh, I've got to, I've got to have a minimum of two frames in each direction. Uh, yeah, well, let's let's make this um, more of a rectangular, uh, sort of triangular shape. So now we've. This is, this is not the way you do it, but I'm just doing it very roughly to get a, a rectangular shape and resist. Um, and so, yes, yeah, say we want to have a core. And uh, these these members um, would have to be in the y direction, and so so we're having a, a, a structural wall as a core. Uh, we've got two walls, and they're going to be quite short. So go back to the fr uh, floor plan. So bring these walls and start to make a core. Now, if we if we want to have a um, a triangular core, that that is feasible. But what we'd have to do is. Um, no, in no. What we would have to do, and in resist, would have to model it as a square core. Um, but then, in our design project, we could 
we could approximate that that rectangular core in a, as a triangle. And so um, if I just draw on there, um, okay. So if resist tells me this is what I need for a structure, then, then I mean, I, I think it would be reasonable you know, to have, have a core in your design, something like that. But just be aware that when you have a core, you know, you always, well, usually you need some quite large openings for circulation. And so that means that if you're going to use a core, these walls have to be longer than usual in order to accommodate the, the penetrations for, you know, uh, circulation, uh, for getting to elevators, getting to toilets, getting to stairs. And so you have to be careful about those walls, uh, sorry, those penetrations. But yes, this is an ex a good example of how you just um, use resist and then you make changes to accommodate your design. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, so basically it's okay to uh, model our core with a uh, sheer wall, even though we have to be very careful in real design because we need to make openings, uh, but yeah. it's still acceptable for the students. I think so, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, that's usually the issue. And also, um, uh, yeah, we know that sheer wall should be uh, so minimum in terms of opening, but uh, then we use sheer wall for a core and then sometimes for uh, emergency stairs and we still need to make some doors or opening for elevators. And uh, also, uh, actually- well, just, just, just before you move on, can I just say the other option is, okay. is, for, is for this area to be a non-structural core. Mm, okay. And in that case, you would move your you'd move your structure. So you might have a moment frame. You might have moment frames just on each of your perimeters. And so this would not be a structural core. And so all your earthquake forces are resisted by, by frames like that. So what you would do in resistors, you would tell resist that like you had a frame there, you had a frame there, a frame there, a frame there, and a frame there. And you see these two frames here, they would give you, if you added them up as it were, they would give like a vector frame at that position. And so that's another way we can do it. We can, instead of having like a diagonal frame that resist cannot model, we model a frame in the y direction and a frame in the x direction that when they combine, they would give like a diagonal frame. And so that's another way to get a very approximate feel for the dimensions of those frames. So that's another option for a student to consider. Okay, so uh, basically uh, create a earthquake resisting structure all at the outside and then yes yeah. yeah the core will be just for gravity exactly perfect <laughs> <laughs> yeah. perfect it's just sometimes it's still a bit complicated for them to think like that prof because yeah yeah uh, yeah no i i agree it is complicated 
Um, but if, as long as they know these these are these are options yes. that are possible. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would like to invite students now, since uh, you still have, I think, yeah, maybe not much, but maybe less than 10 minutes to discuss. Maybe one question will be enough from the students, especially because if I uh, will need to raise another question, then actually I have a lot. Uh, after they apply this in the seventh semester, uh, yeah, some uh, issues uh, usually related to building shape uh, will appear and then uh, they will ask uh, a lot of questions about that. But uh, I think uh, let's check from uh, the third semester students point of view also. So please, uh, even though this is the first time you um, see this kind of simulation, it's fine. You can ask uh, anything, no worries, uh, no problem. Maybe uh, they saw that uh, usually the senior students use this one. Uh, but uh, as you see, this is very easy actually and practical. So you can start using it from uh, now, even for your third studio uh, project. It's still very possible. Okay, I would like to invite students for one last chance for uh, questions. Are you sure you don't have anything to ask again? Is everything is so clear? <laughs> I hope okay. so. <laughs> so Omar is in again. Okay, please Omar. Yeah. Uh, okay, doctor. I have another question uh, about yes, the please. column size. About the column size, uh, is it depend on uh, uh, the building uh, condition and the building function, or uh, it based on the building codes? As last two weeks, we took uh, a session uh, from Dr. Janita, uh, explained to us uh, uh, tributary area and column size, uh, and the doctor gave us an explanation about uh, the hospital. Like uh, we have many rooms and uh, uh, it's better to make uh, like uh, uh, for each room, I think for columns, it's better. Like if anything badly happened, like earthquake for the building, uh, a little bit of rooms will uh, affect it badly, not too much rooms. So it depends on a building code or uh, the function or uh, of the building. Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, first of all, the size and or the cross-sectional area of columns to resist your gravity forces depends only on the tributary area supported by the column. And so the, uh, the size of a column, just to support your gravity loads, is only a function of the tributary area that the column is withstanding. But when it comes to columns and that are part of moment frames to resist earthquake, the column size, as we've seen, it is related to the type of building. And for a hospital, the columns will be significantly larger than um, the columns for an office building of the same size. And so the size of the columns to resist earthquake, they not only depend on the type of building, but they depend on how many columns we use. And as I've explained, you know, you could design a building with lots and lots of frames, in which case the columns will be quite small, or, you can design a building where you are resisting the earthquake forces on just a few frames, maybe two, in which case the columns will be quite large. And so it's your choice as the architect. You know, you go back to your program and your design concept and you say, well, how many frames do I want? What's my preference as, as the architect? And then you... You, you, you do your model and you see if those columns are okay for you. 
if your columns are too big, according to resist, then you've got to put in more columns, more frames. And so you iterate towards a design that you know meets your architectural requirements. Okay, thanks, Doctor. It's clear now. Yeah, good question. Okay, thanks, Omar, for the question. So uh, two weeks ago, when we uh, discussed sizing the column based on tributary area, uh, actually we use a book, and uh, that book uh, just mentioned like how big the tributary area is without mentioning yeah. uh, the function of the building. But uh, when we use resist, uh, in the beginning, you can choose the function of the building. Is it a normal uh, function? Is it a heavy uh, duty function? Is it, uh, I forgot the, the third category, but I think it's like emergency function of building and it will affect the size of uh, the structural components. Isn't it, Prof. Andrew? Exactly, that's exactly right. Um, because every country in the world, uh, let me just go back to the build, uh, building. You know, every country in the world um, makes sure that post-disaster buildings like hospitals, you know, are, are a lot stronger than, than normal structures. I mean, these structures here, low degree of hazard, they would be like um, structures like that you might build, for example, to store grain in, or store um, perhaps animals in. You know, these are structures that that don't need to be so strong because if they were to get really badly damaged, there's, there's not going to be any loss of human life. But, but as I say, these, these ones here, like hospitals, fire stations, uh, police stations, uh, maybe buildings, say like a nuclear reactor that you definitely don't want to get damaged, um, that would be also in this category. And, and so, and, but if you were designing, say, for a movie theater or for a massive um, mall, a shopping center that would have crowds of people in, then you would choose that. And so the column sizes for these more special buildings, yeah, they're going to be significantly larger because these buildings have to be stronger, you know, for the sake of our communities. Okay. So I hope it's clear for Omar and also for everyone. So, uh, our previous analysis using tributary area, it's actually just to help you uh, understand the logic of how we transfer load from some parts of our building, from uh, some a certain area mm -hmm. to some uh, certain uh, structural component. Let's say column A will uh, support tributary area number one, but uh, to be more specific, we need to uh, do the simulations because just by counting the tributary area, first it's just for gravity, uh, and also uh, we still uh, haven't checked the function yet. It's still gen very general. Okay, uh, I could hope I, it. Could could I just add that the tributary area approach it works perfectly for gravity loads, and and so if you have a column that's supporting a certain tributary area, you, you've got a certain cross-sectional um, dimension, cross-sectional area. If that same column is supporting half that tributary area, then in theory, its cross-sectional area can be reduced to one half. Mm. So that, that concept of tributary area, that that is perfectly valid for talking about gravity loads. Yeah, and, and so it's it's an important concept that is still very important for gravity um, load resistance. Okay, thank you, Prof. Andrew, for adding uh, the information. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, it's 10.20 here in Indonesia, so, 
our time is up. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any more time for uh, your questions, but don't worry. We have uh, our record with uh, Mbak Zahra and we will upload this to our uh, channel. So you can uh, check some uh, recordings for today's and uh, last week materials from Prof. Andrew if you need to uh, recheck some uh, points about races or about uh, earthquake related structure in general. And also I would like to present the certificate of appreciations from our uh, Dean of Faculty of Engineering and Planning, uh, Prof. Ilya Fajir Maharika, uh, for young Professor Andrew Charlson. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us as guest professor and uh, provide, us, provide us with uh, new information, especially for our students, tutor, and also lecturer. Thank you uh, once again, Prof. Andrew Charlson, for uh, being here with us today. You're most welcome, and best wishes, everybody. Thank you. And I would like to close our session. Uh, let's uh, recite Hamdallah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And I will see you all uh, next week, inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Prof. Andrew. Bye. Bye, Johanita.